Um, but yeah, so yeah, so to review, as far as where we're at right now, so we don't know how, as far as the schedule of anything, we don't, we can't really tell right now because things are getting worse with the disease and all yep. of that. So, but one thing that can be like related to the actual Steam Camp program, one thing that we can say is perhaps the the remote option is a possibility, though uh, that would be a totally different thing, but not totally different as in whatever value we generate for the steam camps i think the documented part the on, there could be an online component that's relevant that's the same in both cases and in fact it's an opportunity to do really well on documenting all that and offering an online package because uh, actually like if you also then include the kit i mean yeah you can do pretty much a lot of it outside of the the direct communication that you have with your people that you meet but beyond that I mean I think a lot of the experience we can simulate um, numbers as well like if you have a lot of people I mean perhaps it's maybe it's even a, a better opportunity because more people can participate from the comforts of their home so it's like perhaps it's even an opportunity that you know may be quite scalable so yeah yeah, so that's an interesting thing. But I think the first thing altogether is, um, I would say the weakness we have right now is the curriculum needs to get really tight. Like we, um, we've we gone through the program, I think people have in general a pretty good time, but some of the feedback was I think it definitely needs to be more streamlined. So for example, like if we're doing the, uh, say the pen plotter edition, it doesn't take us like four hours. It's an hour exercise, you know. It's a thing where we've got a very tight program. Everything is tight. In fact, today I wrote down some notes. Uh, I kind of started going off on, okay, what do you need to have a super quality, uh, very tight program? And I wrote down like about 30 items that we want to we wanna have. And I don't think we should maybe go through them right now or we can if we want to. But you can get pretty rigorous on, okay, how exactly you do it, how you train everybody to do the same. How do we make sure the quality and the results are the same across the board? How do you involve the community? How do you make it a really valuable thing? At the same time, connect it to the much bigger picture because we're, I think the unique part that we have is unlike anything else, any kind of other kid, is we always strive for that direct relation to industrial productivity on a small scale. Like the real applications, okay, here's how you can scale it or make it practical, like this is a, so we're looking at as modular building blocks, like for example, the DIY Arduino. Well, perfect case like COVID right now, if we have those chips and a few components, we can actually make them ourselves without having to rely um, on having the whole fine detailed full Arduino. We can make a super simple one for a particular purpose. Like right now, I was actually thinking about that as a case example, super simple Arduino with a remote camera to uh, look at my print cluster because now I'm getting ready to do the larger printers and each failed print would be like a $20 loss. So, okay, I want to make sure that if there's any failure, I would have a remote camera to, to watch that. And here's a perfect example. We can use our little system to make an IP camera, for example. So, so always applications to, towards real things and powerful mm. things too. So I think that's the, the real value. And, and I think we can go far um, once again, along the module based approach, uh, trying to like, I, I think if I talk about open source ecology, what are the two main innovations? I would say that's extreme manufacturing and module based design. So extreme manufacturing, the ability that, that you can build a large machine in a single day with a bunch of untrained people, module based design, how you can break down something into such a small part that you can have a large team working on it together in rapid time. So we've seen a great evidence of the limit like literally the limitless potential of each of those now it's time to for the rubber to hit the road i think the relevant thing is on the modularity part is that like especially even r right now like if you talk about for example the the covid personal protective equipment you can completely turn that into a modular construction set and you can really break it down into small elements like okay say there's the masks say there's a filter well the same filter could be an air purifier it could, could be a powered air purifying apparatus for that people wear, the doctors wear. It could be a purifier for a 3D printer. Like for example, Ultimaker has a purifier on their printers so that you don't stink up your room. 
Um, so that's an example of a filter. In it, you have the battery packs, the same battery packs that, that we've done in a steam camp. They could be used to, to power that powered air purifying respirator or mm. battery packs for a headlamp that you can produce or w whatever you got. Um, so you can completely modularize it, filter elements, 3D printed parts, gaskets, uh, even down to things like printing clear materials. There's actually ways to do that. It's, um, there's many, many, many things you can do. Like, so you can think about, okay, so say you got like ear pieces for protection on ears, you've got eye pieces, you got mouth pieces, and, and really try to break it down into small parts that are then tangible, like to develop on a, uh, as a distributed effort. Because uh, for example, you see right now with all the different different projects out there, one comment I could make from the OSC perspective is that they're all like doing this whole thing, project, project, project. But if they all perhaps collaborated and took module, little module that makes up the project, then I think all the projects could collaborate on the modules themselves. And that would be a paradigm shifter. Um, as long as you could manage that process, and I don't think anybody has developed that kind of process, I think we're the closest to having such a process like that but i'm also noticing that right now as we move forward that we're still like we can't uh do a powerful grand collaborative effort because we don't have people you know not enough people but the bigger thing is also not enough people knowing the collaborative literacy part the techniques and tools of how you work as a large team so uh, i think that, is that final part is like really a selling point because um i've been looking around and there are so many COVID 19 uh, open source groups and groups and helping medical groups yeah. and such. The biggest problem is almost to have a, like a clear process development flow for these collaborative pro yeah. projects, have a way to coordinate, um, having work not being dupli duplicated because like you have hundreds of people who make different versions of masks and maybe only one of them will actually be useful. Yeah. Um, and so one way which open source ecology can really contribute is to use the experience of how to develop um, a resource with people who are not maybe from the beginning trained engineer, like what is the yeah. minimal um, education which is necessary to be able to help in a productive mm. way, which actually is meaningful. Um, so there's a lot of content there. And I think if, if people have that yeah. ability and those competences and tools and practical tools, if yeah. they know, okay, if I want to help then first I do one, then I do two, then I do three, then uh, people's motivation might be longer. But uh, right now when there's like COVID-19 is clear focus of so people are already motivated, but people will also be able to be more helpful and more productive. Uh, yeah, I think if if we manage to teach this in a good way. Um, yeah. And on the second note, which you mentioned earlier to look into the ability to maybe do online teaching or online collaboration is also a huge part yeah. uh, as it would allow to scale uh, without needing to be on each location um, yeah. and would also allow for income which doesn't r require as much cost for each time it runs. It might uh, require an initial cost, but once it's up and running, uh, then it's basically just produce benefits and, and profits. Um, yeah. Except for those who, who, who copy the open source, which they can do as well, but then at least it produces uh, benefits. Um, yeah. So it might be a really good opportunity to teach people about coordination and a good opportunity for us to learn how uh, this can be taken into a virtual reality. Yeah. Um, no, that's, that's right. Uh, I agree with you on those points. That's, uh, I think we're on the same page. And the thing that also I think I'm getting more clarity on is the, uh, I've been talking for a decade about mass creation of right livelihood. And we have to be very explicit about it. And why I'm calling out for the larger numbers is that the initial intent of the Steam Camps, the nine day version, was that we do significant development in those five project days on a real product that then goes into the open source everything store uh, and is something that you got your printer, you can bootstrap to a production grade printer like the Pro, but you can start making these things. So there's one, one side is 
the experience that you're learning, the skills, but we can't forget about the part of economically significant production. And right now, I think my, my mind has shifted. Like, I think the metric we want to talk about is probably how do you create a, an enterprise? Like, how do we attract thousands of people to develop that are required to develop this new economy, right? Uh, I think the one clarity, to, I was just thinking about it today, is 50 bucks an hour. Can we create a robust open source distributed enterprise that gets you 50 bucks an hour? That's and, and we can start looking at the numbers. So you got yourself a 3D printer. You can start getting into production of various things. You can start an online print shop, uh, which actually I was thinking about that. That's actually not a bad idea because the tools are pretty much such that within the wiki you can create an online uh, 3D printing web order service relatively easily. Uh, things like that. But there's if you go through all the options, there's a lot of different opportunities, and I think there's a whole product ecology that can be created, and I think that's the way we have to frame it. Like when we approach people, it's like, okay, this is something you can do. Oh, I mean, we've been saying this. You can do this, say the Steam Camps is a part-time thing, but if you really want to take control of your self-determination, as in like you're going to be working for what's meaningful for you, uh, we take that, of course, as open source economic development of one form or another, then yes, you have an opportunity to, to do that. So the message we can give to people is, okay, this is not a, like, once again, we're different than anything else in that it's about real livelihood creation. And with the 3D printing, it's, um, I think we're getting very, very close to, to breakthrough on that. Um, I think the two missing links are which are readily attainable. One is the slightly larger printer, like 12 or 18 inches, 18 inches probably. So you can put like a whole, you don't have to do like 10 prints to print out parts. You do one print on this big bed and that's your, another replication of a printer. Because right now it takes a bit of time. Say you got an eight inch bed on our pros right now. I mean, you got to do multiple, many multiple prints to get all the parts for another pro. Uh, so mm -hmm. with a larger bed, one time. So we're talking five minutes of labor you know, you basically maybe babysit the uh, first, you know, make sure the first layer gets good. But like five minutes just to hit run and print it and you got a whole good product that you can sell at a decent price um, because your labor is very much affordable in that case. So, so the larger printer is one, readily attainable, and that's how we can actually like, I was thinking about that, it's like, wow, we are so well positioned to do that. Um, because we are completely scalable right now. The exact same technology that works for the 8-inch will work for uh, about an 18-inch bed. Might might work up to 24 inches. But the same thing, the 3D printed corners and everything like that. Uh, and the other thing is the high temperature chamber, build chamber, because right now I say that you can effectively print in PLA and TPU, uh, PETG, that's about it. Everything else warps once you get off the bed and um, it's really limited what you can do right now, but with the high temperature chamber, you're talking about perfect prints in nylon, polycarbonate, PEEK, PEI. I mean, these are these advanced plastics that, you know, medical grade things for high temperature things like people are talking a lot about in the COVID crisis. They say, okay, you got to have things that are washable in hot water. Well, you can't mm. do that with PLA, um, yeah. stuff like that. So. So yeah, the high temperature chamber, I'm working on it. Like right now I'm getting a larger printer set up, um, but I think there's huge opportunities there. So essentially the you've got yourself a 3D printer and a torch table. I'm, I'm basically gonna, like right now, what I'm doing is I'm getting the torch table and printers up so we can make shredders. Cause actually I'm running into not being able to get filament. I, I already cannot get the same black filament from Matter Hackers, it's sold out. Gee, mm. okay. The supply chain issues are hitting already. So actually, the new printers are going to be blue because I can't get black. Um, so that's that's one artifact. But that tells me, okay, shredders, we're making our plastic, and that's going to happen within a few weeks because we got to do it. Uh, so, but with the um, torch table cutting out shredder parts, you got the three D printers, torch tables. That's a robust micro factory right there, and we have to be very clear about it. It's like the amount of products you can do. Like um, examples, my headphones. This amazing 3D printed rubber wallet, parametric and open SCAD. Um, look at Chris Log on the wiki. You can parametrize it. That's a product. Um, 
Is this soft part also? Is it TPU or what's the material? This one is TPU. It's rubber. It's this. It's super flexible. It's very flexible, but you can't rip it. It's this is a really good product. This is a well designed mm. thing. You can change the number of pockets. You can change the size. It's all parametric and open scan. This is a product. Yeah. Uh, these headphones um, are a product. It's like it's literally unlimited like fittings i mean it sounds simple but fittings rubber o-rings i mean it's just insane what you can do like take these ear protective uh these are not 3d printed but take these sound muffling ear muffs i mean that's basically this in a little different way like you make the band the headband stronger and stuff like that so there's that construction set approach thing but yeah um the power is really immense and and i think I mean, the challenge is that, so how come we can't get any people to do this? And I think we got to get very clear on what it takes to, okay, let's attract the people. Let's give them a very clear value proposition for what they're getting into. But why I said the 12 by 12 program, so 12 by 12 means 12 events, 12 people each. Um, did you take a look at the 10X is easier than 2X? Yeah. What do you think of that? Um, I think it's it's good. I mean, in in one way, it's so optimization or like global optimization instead of micro optimization. Yeah. Like once you reach a certain peak, you can't really go any further. So you put so much effort, and, and there's no big difference. Uh, what was new to me was the uh, thinking about it from a psychological perspective Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that, um, so the macro thing, like the global thing, I've always like been thinking about that, about that since I think in terms of like system innovation. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, the psychological parts, especially, I think it. I don't know if it's true for everyone, but definitely for like the entrepreneurial open type uh, uh, who like scores high in openness uh, and who basically wants self determination. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, so that part was was nice. Um, yeah, and uh, I think I'm actually going to try his method. It, it was like increasing free, free energy things and take away free stuff, as he called it. Uh, stuff, yeah, get rid of stuff. stuff. So yeah, I put exactly. a link. So I'm taking notes. If anyone wants to see that, 10x is easier than 2x. It's on the wiki. Andreas notes. That's going to go on today's meeting notes. But um, yes, you said it. It's the psychological perspective that's critical. And if you study what I'm doing, I've been doing that the the whole initial premise of gvcs is, is that it's a big hairy audacious goal and it's impossible so that's where it takes creativity to do that and i totally resonate when i saw that 10x is easier than 2x i was like wow that is super cool and i've been practicing that maybe for like a year or two in terms of how i think about things yeah. um so but based on that what can we say about say the 12 events times 12 like is it possible okay so if we take that as a premise then we can say there's a there's marketing there's cost of customer acquisition uh, there's certain prerequisites that are needed for that event so how about if we just outline in detail exactly what that is and I think we like we talked about the curriculum that thing we need to get it super tight uh, what I'm seeing with the curriculum specifically is that there's about 12 or so lessons in the first four days that need to be super tight the first day i can handle that but we don't have a super tight thing on a, on a plotter on a mill on an arduino those are kind of like we're kind of bumbling through it and learning like some people love that like jessica didn't mind that she she loved that kind of environment but i think um, a lot of people would like more more structure and it's like bam let's just get it done and i think that's that's actually provides more value too because you can still do all the exploration but after you get these basics just bam out of the way um so the curriculum is one of the bigger requirements but then we can say what are all the other requirements in this package that need to be in place for a result to be obtained and then we can say well how do we measure those things and how upon measurement how do we improve them all the time but i think we can start with a i mean i'd be willing to go to say okay let's say 12 by 12 and let's be honest as far as what it takes and then we can identify a bunch of gaps and then we can say okay are we in a position to meet those gaps or what other require what else do we need 
and have that can meet those requirements. And I think that'll be a useful approach because um, I think the psychological game here, it's like we got to make it uh, 10x better and, and really excite people. And I think that excitement is already there. Uh, and I think the my feedback on the overall thing is that, yes, the program warrants this approach where you say, like even like if it takes money to pay people to develop that, like do that curriculum, I mean, maybe that's what it takes. Then we have to get it. Um, hmm. What are all the other ways? Like, can we offer, like, say we recruit a number of people by different approaches. We can take, okay, we need people, absolutely. We can take a look at, okay, what are the best strategies for doing that? Do we have the time? Do we have the resource to do that? Or can we get the resource, like get, get this funded or something? But I'm thinking that um, the biggest value of, that exists anywhere is the people. I think mm -hmm. if we can approach it through the perspective of the people, because we don't need money, we need that which money can buy, and that is people's time, uh, and yeah. but not time, their focus, right? So can we get their focus through other ways? Uh, is the question. So we can explore that and get get rigorous on what it. What exactly is required? What incentives we can, we can put in place? Maybe we haven't been thinking about some incentives. One thing that comes to my mind is like, what if we take a look at like, say we do do look at the global schedule. Because um, uh, so let's see, let's take a look at that Steam Camp schedule. There's a page called Steam Camp schedule, and in it we have a link to the calendar, which is breaks throughout the world, sea vacations. But this is what. Let me actually share my screen there. So for vacations, this is an outline that says that uh, the circled parts show those breaks in countries in the northern and southern hemisphere across the globe. Well, there's a break every single month except like November, October, November, are leanest, but everywhere else you got plenty of breaks like vacations because basically you have to think that December and January is the summer in the southern hemisphere and that's a break for the southern hemisphere so mm. you've got that so definitely it's possible to do two steam camps a year and now you can you, you start to think okay what other breaks are there but but if you look at this there's major um, like I, I picked big markets China Japan USA South Africa at least 50 million populations. China's into the billion. But those are all big markets that are scattered every quarter. Uh, so maybe that's the way to go. Uh, but what about like if we were to reach out, okay, let's let's try to recruit a leader for that, you know, let's work hard on, okay, let's get so the Chinese lead of the steam camp or whatever, or the Japanese lead. So maybe like focus by country or something like that and go through the Yeah, or region. Yeah, or region. And, I mean, there are some problems with, with like some of the countries where, um, so I discussed a lot with Sivash regarding like Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and, and mainland China. Mm -hmm. And uh, English is definitely one of the biggest challenges. Um, people may understand, be able to read, but maybe their ability to contribute in English uh, is a little bit limited. One way of trying to kind of use that to our advantage is to uh, was his proposal to combine it with the with making the proposal that this is not only about open source but it's also an ability for you to learn English because a lot of people in these countries want to improve their English as well um, so it's kind of using that as part of the branding instead of seeing it as an obstacle oh. um, and then another huh. alternative is to go f for uh, private schools where there are more people who have uh, uh, English teaching as a major focus um especially in in china taiwan and, and hong kong well hong kong wouldn't be a problem but uh taiwan and mainland china like Ch uh chongcheng uh, mm -hmm. or however I pronounce that in south of china is a big yeah. tech hub uh yeah where we we would be able to probably hopefully make something um of course we will have other difficulties there but um working in terms of like the um eastern asian region as one 
big project I think is quite mm. good and then focusing mm. on Europe mm. well Europe and Africa same time zone um, so that us America both North and South America are in one time zone yeah um, yeah that's right um, yeah um, did you have a chance to look on the Steam camps review uh, which I made uh, before yeah. I got your document. Um, I think I saw that. I, I saw I saw your feedback on a document. Okay, so I made another document. I posted the link in the chat and on the log. Um, Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is more like a thinking document, but like before um, putting down a strategy for the different goals, I wanted to more or less question every goal, like uh, just asking why over and over again, like what's the purpose of all yeah. of the different parts, and then reconstruct new goals out of that. Um, and the initial results yeah. uh, are the parts I put in, the, in this list from that. And okay. then we can, of course, let's um, before we get go there, let's let's also review something else, which is um, what I mentioned about one of the clarities is about mass creation of right, right livelihood. So how does this fit into the overall product strategy of OSC? So you got the steam camps, which are in theory, pr fueling people to to be capable to participate in, a, in an incentive challenge. But Lately, I've also been thinking, okay, there's the, how does this relate to the open source everything store? How do we, uh, so templates on a wiki where you ac actually have a buy button, right? Yeah. How can we include that as the after part of the events? Because I think we can continue yeah. the development. After. It's an important part. Um, it's something which I put in italic uh, in this document as well, uh, and very short about it, uh, basically nothing about it, just about it, that it would bring value for the people who are there uh, because of our mission of self-determination and their ability to create what they need themselves. So it is a very natural and logical next step. Um, one thing which can, which I'm thinking both combined with what you said before regarding micro factories is to brand kind of a micro factory that people will learn how to build a micro factory, but we will also help them and mentoring them um, to some degree into using this micro factory to actually earn a living. Um, so it can be that when they don't only come and build things and then we forget about them, that uh, part of the steam camp might be, let's say they would build a micro circle economy. So maybe they build a 3D printer, a shredder and a filament extruder. Um, and then the next part of the course can be how to capitalize on that. Yeah. And we and part of the training, they set up accounts and they do what is necessary for them to when they come home, they can actually you directly use the products um, and earn a living from it. Yeah, um, I like it. Uh, so and, the, yeah. I, I put down some notes about the before, during and after unit of the, the whole event. Just w one more yeah. thing here. When you talk about s setting up a micro factory, one thing so basically think about this already like we were going pretty decent into the summer right? we were lining up three events in private schools that were uh they promised that they would have a captive audience of at least 12 students uh that was good and then one discussion also led to hey there's a chamber of commerce on my island this was in washington they'd love to hear something about that so so schools say private schools or other school or just individuals definitely looking up a like who's a stakeholder in a community who wants this it's like how about a chamber of commerce that is all about entrepreneurial development and w and the guy the guy in washington said hey if if you pr propose the startup of a micro factory to the chamber of commerce you, you'll easily get that funded because there a lot of chambers of commerce also have initiatives where they fund projects in their community so you're combining the local person with that kind of a funding source and maybe maybe we make mm. that part of the program it's like okay so part of this 
we're going to teach you or encourage you to reach out to your chamber of commerce, get mentorship, like, and so forth. I mean, that's that's another opportunity we have not really touched. We we're, we we're just getting into that as before the virus broke out. Um, but that's that's yeah. definitely a way. Like thinking about the the micro factory in a community. Like start with a single printer. Have a com some some space. Like go. Th I would say definitely the chamber of commerce. Go to the chamber of commerce ask for somebody to donate you a space on Main Street, you know, a room where you're running your 3D printer shop or whatever. Uh, so you're starting to get into the, okay, here's the physical space. We can start meetups there. We can start the actual classes and things like that. Um, and one last thing about business development I was thinking about is the idea of position this. So I've actually w watched um, uh, Fred Rogers. You know Fred Rogers? Oh, sorry. Oh man. Uh, it's a wonderful neighbor day in the neighborhood. You guys don't know Fred Rogers in, in Europe? So he's no. a big... Uh, Jessica, you clearly know Fred Rogers, right? <laughs> Who that is? So I, I don't know if Jessica's there. Uh, Fred Rogers is the guy... Uh, it was just a movie that came out about, about him, but he was a guy who ran this children's TV show, and he was like the most beloved guy in American TV and had a program for the longest time in American history for like 30 years until he died. But he was basically teaching children how to feel good and deal about themselves and deal with their emotions and how to grow up mm. and stuff like that. And he dealt with real topics like mm. death, divorce, and I mean everything, parents quarreling. And so he, it was um, super inspiring. But based on that, it's like I was thinking about that. It's like, okay, that's when I think of OSC, like so Fred Rogers talks a lot about authenticity and if I talk about OSC it's like we also talk about authenticity and an ethical economy so Fred right. Rogers was interesting in that his one of his platforms was or points was let's teach the, our children not to be consumers I was like wow that's pretty cool uh, so thinking about that I think we can brand one of our events like the builds like I, I mentioned the internet camera project right well, if you analyze the Internet Camera Project, China can offer that for you for $18. But what they can't offer you is the experience of like really owning that because you can use it for your life if you build it yourself. But also, what about the, a child-parent bonding relationship? Okay, sign up for a workshop, three hours, build it, bond with your children. So basically, and, and teach your children not to be consumers kind of a deal. So I thought this kind of a package... Uh, outside of so there's this steam camp which is the big deal for nine days like serious you're you're into actually contributing to real product development but then there's this super tiny thing which could be excellent for marketing purposes and getting tons of people to get a little taste of what this is about so that's just a thought I had yesterday and I think that's we gotta hit that in some way because that would feed directly into the open source everything store those would be products that well, for the three-hour parent, uh, parent, child session, we'd have to have those products well developed. But to develop them, like once they're developed, they'd be excellent kits and products for the open source everything store, that could be sold as kits. They could be sold as the real live experience um, in your community micro factory. So there's this whole web of. Um, of things we can be thinking about in this whole package, but okay, I'll I'll shut up and let's let's go through uh, more of the analysis of the Steam camps. Um, I think it is a really good idea, and one thing which has worried me a little, or like okay, maybe not worried, but like is the biggest obstacle is the nine day event because as it is yeah. right now, we need, as I understand from from your experiences, that what is five day part we need a lot of participants and it's hard to get participants before they have trust that we can deliver something. So if, if we need a lot of participants in order to attract a lot of participants, uh, it might be a bit uh, tricky. Uh, so one thing which I was thinking is if there's a way to kind of bulletproof a good experience regardless. Um, and one of the things I'm thinking about uh, mm -hmm. was if it's possible to somehow separate the two parts, like the four, four day part and the five day part. This is just an idea. I'm not sure if it's a good idea, but uh, uh, and that the five day apart is more like a global online experience uh, so that people learn how to collaborate even when they're not physically there. 
um, so, uh, the four, you might have four day building camp event and then you might have like follow up weekend events where you together develop a product, product, uh, a product and then you set up your account on Amazon or on open source everything store and then you sell sell it and then you review how it went as yeah. a set of, of follow up um, online workshops. And in this way, if there's a collaboration of projects, you can also have people who post online that, okay, this is my idea, this is my project. If anyone else wants to join it, then you can join in. And then they have a couple of weeks of finding other people who are like-minded. And then in th this case, they would be able to find people from other parts of the world as well uh, without having the same problem of, of uh, not being in the same time zone, as well as even if there's not so many people on the original platform or on the, on, in their place, there might be a lot of people in, in, another, in another place of so people who are still interested in it. Uh, I think bulletproofing and a great experience is a good, good notion. For the five day global experience, that would require a crash course, but I think that the crash course, like what I'm seeing is like a four hour crash course um, on the four main topics, like one is one is just OSC, two is FreeCAD, three is collaboration, and four might be like enterprise. Uh, but like really distilled, here's the tools, here's how we work so people can work effectively together, um, which would be a before unit of the Steam Camp. Like that, that we could publish. So uh, the idea would be that for the people that take the Steam Camp, they're not seeing the material for the first time. They're actually practicing and reviewing. But for the people, say, like if you said the five-day is a global online experience maybe that's other people well they would have to definitely take like the base the the four basic hours they would also have to have the prototyping equipment which is the 3d printer primarily so so somehow that could would need to be addressed um, the one detail there is that we use 1.2 nozzles which means we can get prints in an hour that would take like five hours normally or whatever things that are practical in a short day versus like with a 0.4 nozzle it's like you have to wait till tomorrow so a lot of people will not be set up for 1.2 nozzles because everyone does 0.4s. But you know that's that's one thing to we have to address. Like we can either tell people, okay, switch switch out, upgrade to like the bigger nozzles with bigger heater blocks, or get one of our printers or however. But but some of this experience, like the the thing about D3D um, Universal, is that the fat nozzle is there for a purpose and it's for really rapid prototyping and strong prints that are fast. So. Um, but yeah, uh, bulletproof a great experience. Um, I like it. Uh, so yeah, I, I wasn't thinking like this five day instead of the four days. I was thinking that you have the four days on place, so you actually get to build uh, oh, the yeah. necessary equipment, and then you take it home, oh. and then you use them for the five day online experience. Oh. So it's like two modules of the same course. Oh. Uh, so it's oh, not that people go directly into the five day without having been on the workshop. Mm. Um, actually like it a, would yeah it w would also allow if necessary to have another setup of workshops where it's uh, run on the weekends the first two weekends so that if it would be uh, impossible for example i know in uh, again in, in taiwan and also in mm. japan uh, they basically don't have vacation they might have one week vacation mm. uh, and then taking one week off mm. of going on these camps is not really realistic uh, unless there are there are some makers uh, i understand that like in hong kong and taiwan in Chongqing, there are some maker spaces uh, i don't know about japan but probably but if you want to uh, then it would allow us to to kind of distribute the same experience but in a longer time frame mm. combining offline with online training or on-site training mm. that's interesting now um, when I was looking at the schedule on vacations, it looks like Japan is like March 15 through April 4. So they do have their like three or three week or so. They have, have official uh, vacation, but uh, uh, it's many people don't take the vacation because do many do? people don't take the vacation. So uh, what do they do? They, they take like other they classes. Work. Uh, they work instead. Or are you thinking about schools? Schools. Oh, okay. Uh, well, schools. So, in China, they are on crime, uh, on like tr uh, schools after school schools, uh, cram schools. Is that mm. the word? Yeah. Um, I don't know about Japan. Yeah. Gosh, has many connections in Shenzhen. 
Yeah. Gosh. I think. Who's uh, Gosh? Gosh, global open source hardware. Ah, oh, okay. Thought it was a person. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, but I think um, I think to get to the point, uh, the the number one thing is I want to ask you how uh, how much time you can spend on this. But it's like we need to take those twelve. I kind of am counting about twelve. These lessons that we need to get super tight. So either like so somewhere that energy has to come in. To someone needs to do it. Um, we could either find a number of people or one of us over time, one or few of us over time gets gets to do them i'm thinking that like to do all everything that's needed for like a one hour will take like 40 hours a pop if we want to get it to like really polished marketable product i'd say but that's only 12 weeks that's just three months of full-time work by a single person if that were to happen um uh, that's that's my estimation uh, what i was doing uh, was uh, i was looking at the curriculum that we talked about already and just trying to get really rigorous on okay hour by hour game plan and what's realistic and what's just really scope it out in full detail as far as what's going on in there mm. um, and then accept the relevant course content we have to ensure that we have high quality teaching delivery uh, which is we have to have good instructors who deliver this teaching as well and that's yeah. something which takes time uh, even if if people are knowledgeable like that you know something it's not the same thing that, as you're a good teacher True. Um, and the same if you're a good teacher doesn't mean that you're good at teaching this thing um, it take, does take time to really develop uh, and it's part of the experience as well um, having people to be on board uh, and in order to have good teachers the teachers also need to have good supportive material and have good training uh, mentorship uh, and so forth so it's definitely there's many points at the same time which needs to go together to to make this happen. Um, yeah, one comment I would have is, uh, so to strategize how to do that most effectively. So what if, um, so what's the strategy for development of the curriculum? Development and delivery. Um, right um, I yeah, um, I would like to first like establish which goals we have and then build the strategy based on that, so we don't build a strategy based on the existing goals. Uh, okay. If it's possible, that we like review all of the okay, go ahead. The uh, goals. Um, and you had, did you have a list already of the course content comments? Uh, maybe I can add that as well. Course content comments. Document. Yeah, you said that you had like, some thoughts about which part of the courses are are good and which parts of the. Uh, uh, I could break that down based on the last. Like I can like probably take the uh, today I was drawn up like in my notebook I was listing like I, I see about 12 units of one hour um, that's one one side is that what you're referring to um, so yeah both the uh, how you're thinking in terms of modules if you already yeah. have some thinking but basically all you're thinking about the course content, uh, course content. if you have anything and written down um, or, or in your head, any type of experience. Also looked through the reviews which people have been given. But um, like if there are some days which worked very well, then it's good to know. Uh, so we can look closer on that and what went well and so forth. I would say, um, I, I can tell you one thing, and it's, that's a start which needs to happen right, and that's the printer needs to, we need strict quality control on it. In, the, in New Zealand, we, we got stuff built and then it, we kind of kept messing with the printers. Um, but either a remote or on-site person that's dedicated to that, that's super important to guarantee that you build it, you build it once and it works and you don't have to go back at all to anything in a printer. That's That level is going to be critical because otherwise then we're, we've got curriculum in front of us and then we have to fix something on a printer. That's not, That can't happen. That's That would be the start number one because all the machines rely on a printer uh, for them to happen. So what happened in New Zealand, we took longer um, and basically missed like a day of curriculum. Um, yeah. It's like, no, that's not good. So, yeah. Um, is it enough to fix the things like, is it bugs in the development which needs to be fixed? Is it enough to fix a certain uh, future or add something or, or is it that I we think, need? 
I think it's it's adding fifty dollars more to the kit, which is you never come to the program without a built extruder. That was my experience from New Zealand. We succeeded decently in uh, in Texas. So I can talk about my experience, but um, we were able to build extruders that worked really well. But this time around in New Zealand, nobody could get their extruder to work properly. I think actually actually there was one detail that. I think was a killer and that was that we had three millimeter filament and the problem is three millimeter filament is not always three millimeter filament some of it is three millimeters and some is 2.85 we had the three millimeter mm. version and our printer is designed for 2.85 so I think that was the thing that was just killing us and we kept getting clogged up um, mm. but things like that it's it's just a bunch of critical details that you have to go through a checklist of every single one is not forgotten acknowledged explicitly not like oh it may or it may not work it's like no explicit long list of of checkpoints so i think yeah. i think it's there but it's just someone's just got to do it like i was in a position to with a bunch of high school kids there like i was in a position to to uh to go through that checklist for everybody so to begin with, we need that, that checklist that needs to be pretty much either self-executing by participants or a remote person or on-site person. It has to be a very clear mechanism for how we go through that quality control checklist. Yeah, okay. Um, and I think, and um, are the people who are were the lead designer or main designer of, of this D3D Universal still active volunteers? Uh, so, um, so Chris, we worked on it during the startup camp, which was Chris, Michelle, and myself. Yeah, they're still on board. Yeah. Right. Uh, this is so a thing. Tough. How do you address it both? I mean, it's how do you address it all? It's it's all actually on the wiki. Like all these things are scattered all over the place. Like we've done a quality control checklist for the D three D nineteen oh six, which was the release. We did that for in the main manual. There's that. There's some on the latest. It, it's scattered in several places. So a lot of this is really about documentation and cleaning yep. it up, putting it all together. Because every single detail that that went wrong, we've we've all, it's somewhere on a wiki. The only problem is, so, it's probably only I know where that all is. But someone can really scour the wiki to to get familiar with it. Yeah, um, that brings me to one of the actually goals which I put down, uh, which is so. Let's see if if I go through them. Um, can I, let's see if I can share the screen as well. Yeah. Right. So relevant course content and high quality teaching. So it's let's just add checklists uh, to that one. That's sub goals. Um, instructor teaching. Let's come to that. And you discussed a little bit. Uh, you need value proposition. So let's focus on. And here I also added the entrepreneurial paths, which comes uh, together with what you mentioned before as how can they earn a living after this and giving them a clear path. But also, there are other paths which is unique value. They might be able to use the design thinking professionally uh, and so forth. Uh, we need media strategy, of course. Um, and when it comes to documentation, this is both for to meet the need of the participants, but also of the instructors Absolutely. and people who, who develops. Mm -hmm. um, basically, to have a, it's good if we have a documentation which is as self-serving as possible. So we yep. provide both documentation, which is uh, all interesting, which is both um, linear. So start here, watch this video, read through these documents, but also non-linear so they can find things when they need to find it. I think that's a quite big yeah, like big thing, especially when you have a very decentralized documentation system as it is right now. Uh, for example, we can have wiki portals and make sure we have a very clear quality control um, of the main pages, but also that we have a um, control of which version is the newest version so that people always know if they don't know which wiki page to go to they at least know which portal to go to so that after so from that portal they will be able to find the, the right wiki page um, i'm not sure if it's it would be very interesting to see if it's possible to combine it with github some somehow uh, i don't know if if that is possible i don't have so much 
experience from that, but some quality control uh, or version control yeah. also for the documents. Uh, for example, Siraj P, he wasn't sure which uh, bill of material to go through if it was the most newest, if it was the newest one, uh, which of the D3D uh, manuals to go through and so forth. He managed to pull it together after a while, but he had to spend a lot of time of looking through the wiki page. Yeah, this, uh, so, this part is mm -hmm. actually like, that's in a four, four hour crash course, but one of them includes taxonomy. Like for example, the way you can find uh, to address the issue of version, you go to 3D printer genealogy page on the wiki and tells you what the latest version is. So there's genealogies. It's, there's a small lesson on taxonomy that people who want to develop, like the instructors definitely have to be no, uh, familiar with uh, genealogy. But yeah, this, this is stuff that we really need to, like the before, during, after unit of this whole program, we got to make those resources crystal clear and just organize all of this. But yeah. The other yeah. thing is that I want to mention is templates on the wiki. So if you notice the development template, uh, you s yeah. last last meeting I showed one liner and it gets you that whole template all seeded with the correct uh, placeholders. Uh, templates, we got to get back to them and use them on the wiki. Um, yes. So also, so that would be a part of the training as well to yeah. provide training of how to use the self-serving documentation. Yeah. Um, but I also imagine that some people, it's good if each page has some kind of pointer to where to look for if you are lost. So if someone comes from a Facebook page or another group or another web page and they land on the our D3D Universal uh, page, that they have enough enough information to figure out how everything works uh, yeah. without having gone gone through. Yeah, that's process. that's called like uh, yeah quality control on those wiki pages. We need a like a manager for the wiki pages, uh, like a. But that could also be addressed in a big way through templates. So here you have the formal template. It really li lays out all the content that needs to be there. And through either a single line or multiple short lines, somebody can get the proper documentation for the whole the whole, um, whole thing. So temp we can have specialized templates for everything. Like one is the development. One is like a project page. Like during the Steam Camp, we use this template. I mean, there's tons of them you can make. So you should probably prioritize um some that are relevant to this organizational effort like you know how you have info boxes and pages on wikipedia that all look like well organized or decently organized we need something similar to that um info boxes are a good thing and things like that mm. In standard format on the yeah standard boxes. standard format so you, when you see something like okay i recognize it it starts to look like it makes sense mm-hmm but a very relevant thing would be for one for each of the uh, 12 lessons. Maybe start with that. Let's get a good template for what each each should have. And I can get you the, I can like copy my notebook here, but it's uh, not well legible. This is my, pa my page of notes. This is like 33 items that I wrote down. That's what the, <laughs> the curriculum page has to have. I can, I can like, each one of them is a discussion and explanation, though, because I, I put crazy stuff like, well, first of all, it's like a, le like a formal lesson. Like you'd see like a teacher would have a formal lesson plan. You'd have to have a hardware BOM. At the end, you want uh, one radical thing is there's a buy button for the, either the kit or the actual webinar that you do that. So treat that as a single module that goes into the whole mm -hmm. Steam camp, but say you can buy the individual thing even. So there's a product mm -hmm. thing right there associated with that. And a kit that we're making in that lesson should be a marketable kit. It should be something essential that's that's good enough to for people to pay for, um, things like that. So we can get crazy on that, but things like... Um, part library for that particular experiment. So that's free cat and part libraries that you can practice. Um, one item is, the meta item is the template for this page. I, I wrote it as one of the things here. Uh, there's a badge, you know, a badge for how do you know you, you know this? Get a, here's an exam and here's a badge, you know, things like that. Um, so I can, I can kind of, I think it's worth to list them. I'll copy that down into digital format. Um, the other thing that, just for your awareness, so one of our guys is doing a 3D printer workbench. It's a really cool thing because you can now design a 3D printer of any size and, and any axis configuration like pretty quickly. Um, 
but the same pattern in FreeCAD can apply. So you can have a very simple, like what I would like to see for the Steam camps is, um, and that's kind of like more for the power users, but it should be there for power users. But what you do is if you know Python, so FreeCAD is in Python, you would do a simple thing where you put icons, because so, you can reprogram FreeCAD to create any workbench. And there's a, we already know how to do that, and we can template that. So imagine you put like little pictures, little icons on top, which, which correspond to each part of a project. You click it, and it goes into the, uh, into the edit window. You click another. So you basically can compose an entire thing just with a click of a button. You can build that experiment. Like say it's the Arduino. OK, put in the chip. Put in the light, put in the, put in like the electrical components. You can even do that in FreeCAD, um, and then all it is is that the FreeCAD design workbench, say the Arduino design workbench in FreeCAD, all it is is buttons and the fact that the things are already in memory, so you've got that proper CAD that you can now play with. So that's not difficult to execute at all within FreeCAD. And we should probably do that for each each project. It sounds like a little advanced, but when you look into FreeCAD, it's we can template that. So so taking it from the idea that like before we have say have a template for something complex, it's like, wow, where do you start? But once you have the template, you invoke it with one line, you know? That's kind of how FreeCAD can become for the purpose of construction set design. You just populate the FreeCAD workbench with all the CAD. You have simple icons to just put them into the working dock. That's it. And that's that in itself is so powerful because it can save you like minutes, many minutes, like in a in like a minute, you can do what would take you like hours to do if you had the part libraries just in the part libraries on a on a wiki page, you know, so things like that. But I mean, we can go crazy with what what we can do. Uh, but we have to decide, OK, what's the narrow focus of the say it's the lesson on that particular thing that's a very high quality thing what are all those elements that go into that lesson and can we get people like the key is that works is modularity like the the radical modular breakdown we take a very small part so maybe we can start saying okay here's the list of items we need let's now try to get people to do it uh, as small contributions with a larger team the block there being that you have to invite and find those people or more centralized approach where it's like one person gets focuses on that and just gets that done so different ways to do it is there already someone who's working on this work bench did you say um, well so 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 g this guy g look at g log um he's doing a 3d printer workbench now that workbench is advanced because it puts it has logic in it, it, it so g log uh, let me. Uh, so look, I just put it uh, in the chat there. But that's a, actually a. I'm not talking about that level. In there, when you click a button, it actually puts things in the right place. And you can like modify things and things like that. So we're not talking mm -hmm. even at that level of advancement. We're just saying plain, let's get the proper parts to build a complex device. Like for example, imagine how powerful that would be for a tractor. If you had all the modular building blocks for a tractor, you mm -hmm. can just drag and drop them and you can literally, a, a novice can start composing a tractor that will work because the parts in there are engineered already. They're modules mm -hmm. according to our method. So this is like, we have, an amazing, amazing power that we can have here. And imagine, now get a little more funky, add AI to that, where, I mean, that's mm -hmm. super power user stuff, but you can be generating your own generative design is around the corner with FreeCAD and AI, and AI is becoming very open source. So um, stuff like that. But um, anyway, the basic FreeCAD workbench for any project is something I think well within reach. Like, so I could probably learn that in an hour or two, for if G would teach me that, you know, you know, he knows how to do that. So, right. Um, so I'm thinking also like how to modular write not only all of the different content uh, and deliver, but also as we develop 
a good Steam experience in the end, that, uh, how to get income on the way. Uh, one idea is that, as you said, we, we have all of these different modules and make super neat, good parts in collab different parts of types of collaboration um, mm -hmm. later on using that for product development uh, and use building online courses from that um, so that when we have made a course that our instructors will use that we also upload it and, and for example on Udemy uh, um, so people can learn at least the parts where they don't need to have a 3D printer maybe even 3D printed but then they need certain prerequisites um, yeah and yeah, then, maybe maybe we could do an incentive that where we say uh, cr contribute to the event we put on Udemy, you get like fifty percent revenue share or something like that for people who contribute to it. I mean, yeah. have you heard of Sensorica? Yeah, they seem to have stuff r surrounding the Open Value Network, which sounds open, but it's a proprietary consortium. In truth, but I think we can learn a lot from them in terms of how they they solve that intractable problem of attributing the value of contributions. Like, I think that's an impossible problem, but they might have some insights. I actually do want to talk to Tiberius is, is his name. Um, maybe there's some good lessons we have there regarding how, because they, they apparently have a model where they actually can divide, like they keep track of who did what, and then they actually pay people. I mean, I don't believe that's possible, but, but they've had some success with it. I personally don't like the idea of tracking at all. Uh, because the the revenue model for open source is typically where it's open to everybody because it's just too hard to keep track of contributions. But I could see, yeah. like, for example, if you do this course online, it's a small thing, small enough thing, and then we end up, say, posting it. So, yeah, like a 50-50 revenue share, that's, yeah. that's like, it's not going to be fair. The problem is that none, none of it is going to be fair because you yeah. cannot attribute what exactly is it? you can't predict the future of how much is it going to sell and all of that so i believe it's a fundamental impossibility because you can't predict the future simply but uh, i yeah. think we can use it in some way for, in a limited way yeah um i agree uh, i think having like a simple rule is good enough uh, yeah. starting to track how much people do because if we start to track and then we pay up then um well in the end we start to converge towards uh transactional economy and, and I guess that's what we want to move away from but I think that um, yeah. as long as we ourselves need to capitalize on the products uh, we should also invite whoever contributes to do the same yeah um, and so, so yeah 50 50 I think that sounds uh, like a good start and see what happens basically yeah and then um, what I was gonna say is um, I don't know if you picked up from the thing like I, I put up this 12 by 12 that's called 144,000 revenue after materials for each event. I don't know if you picked it up, but I put 25K for an incentive price so that you have a quarterly event and you actually with the revenue from that, you generate the completion of that product that's been started within the Steam Camps into like an incentive challenge which takes the final line to an actual product. So yeah. everything is about we're taking that money and we're pretty much distributing it again. We're funneling into a so-called centralized effort to get concerted directed development, but all the products are open source. Uh, yeah. That's a hard sell, but but I mean, that's, that's what we're trying to do. It's also hard if it's um, based on revenue um, before we know the actual revenue. Um, yeah. Oh, so by the way, I mean, I don't know if you saw the, the meeting with 180 Degree Consulting, but yeah, there there's a team of four students that are working on a marketing stuff. Um, so I basically look at the 180 DC on the wiki. Mm -hmm. um, you've seen that? Um, I've seen there is a video. I haven't looked on the video. Uh, there's a page. I'm putting all of that on the 180 Degree Consulting page on the wiki. And... Um, Take a look at the project proposal, but basically it's like, okay, here's um, basically develop a marketing plan and metrics for how we can really predict our cost of customer acquisition uh, to predict a specific event. And I did run the 12 by 12 concept to them. They seem to take to it mm -hmm. pretty well. I said, okay, we'll, we'll tell you what needs to happen in order for that to be met. That'll be the um, product after- So they're gonna build a marketing plan. Yeah. So right. they've they uh, they've got ten weeks to do that. 
Mm. From this okay. week. Uh, that makes all right. Um, but yeah, how about starting with like focusing on maybe you also can go through the different goals and see what you think about them um, in terms of of uh, yeah. Uh, if you agree or not um, mm -hmm. and then i can add in your goals and then we can build a strategy from that ba 